ever for his spy network, but some species, like the Malabites, couldn't use it, whether for religious reasons or because their physiology didn't allow it. Malabites couldn't touch anything electronic, or it would short out their memories. He wondered if that included battery-operated things like sex toys. Then he pondered if one of Liliana's toys could short him out and get rid of all of these fucked-up days. He should be with his mate, preparing for a baby. Instead, he was in his new war room, prepping for the fight of his life, preparing and pacing the fuck out of the floor. His boot strikes clapped like thunder, rolling in waves around the polished stone walls of his rarely used great hall, its arched ceiling and six massive entrances barely letting the sound escape. The demonic gargoyles perched atop the four corner pillars kept watch, their crimson eyes glowing. As far as he knew, they'd never moved from the obsidian pillars they'd been carved from, although Liliana speculated that they came to life at night, like the exhibits in that museum movie she'd made him watch. Some day, though, they would fly, at least according to the angel who'd carved them with the tools of a dead demon sculptor. They'd serve as protectors when the walls of Sheogra came tumbling down. At the force of the beast's will, the angel had said. Yeah, well, there were still over nine centuries to go before Satan was free, so the gargoyles would just have to wait. Azagoth wasn't going to make it happen any sooner. Satan hated him, had tolerated him running Shale Gras, but Azagoth had no doubt that the bastard was just biding his time until he could someday strike at Azagoth in the most painful way possible. Please, father. Suzanne stepped in front of him as he made his five thousandth pass around the room, over on the table that could seat a hundred. His phone, laptop, and Mullock's cell sat silent. You need rest. I can't rest while my mate and child are suffering. They need you whole. She handed him a steaming cup from the tray next to his electronics. Have some tea. I made it myself. He didn't drink fucking tea. Who the hell did she think he was, the Queen of England? Come on, she said, completely oblivious to his glare. Let me at least get you to your room for a shower and a change of clothes before the battle begins. Dress for success and all that. Suzanne had always had the spunky, positive attitude of a Disney princess, but at least what she proposed was halfway reasonable, and maybe it would get her, Hawken, Cypher, and Jasmine off his ass about getting some rest. No, he didn't need it, not in the way mortals did, but quiet time and sleep helped speed up healing— both physical and mental. The thing was, he didn't need to heal jack shit. What he needed was his mate. I have to talk to Zubal. He said he had an update about the investigation. Hazegoth started to put the cup down, but Hawken blocked him. Where had he even come from? I just came from talking to him. He emailed you a list of everything given to Liliana since she got back, and who gave it to her. He's interrogating everyone. Azagoth arched a brow. Even you? Hawken growled. I was the first. He gestured to the cup. Now you don't have an excuse not to go with Suzanne. Grimly amused, because Z was a hard-ass bastard when he was in mission mode, Azagoth downed the tea, which could have used a shot of whiskey to make it palatable, and handed the cup back to Suzanne. I can find my way to the bedroom. He swiped both phones from the table. If you hear anything about anything, let me know immediately. I'll be back in ten. On the way to his room, he checked both phones for updates. There wasn't any low-level chatter about his forces building in Mullock's territories yet, but the underworld was definitely talking about the rash of demons falling dead and then rising again as completely different people. Criminians were gathering the souls of those who had been forced out of their physical bodies by the souls he had set free, and so far they had brought in almost seventy thousand, which meant that thirty thousand of the bastards he had released hadn't found a suitable demon to take over. Hurry up, you picky fuckers, he muttered as he entered the bedroom. The door closed, and a huge instant weight lifted from his shoulders. This room had never been his favorite place in Shale Gras, but since Liliana's arrival, it had become his sanctuary.